Well, welcome. This is another um, session of Black History Conversations. It's going to be a really interesting session today because we're going to be uh, finding out about the British firearms industry and the Atlantic slave trade. A really difficult subject, but I'm sure that Nick's going to make it interesting for us. Um, and um, I'll be introducing Nick in a moment. Um, I'm Liz Millman from Learning Links International, and we've got others from the, the team that organised Black History Conversations here with us. Simon Faringo from Belong Nottingham. Um, uh, David Alston is joining us from uh, way up in the Highlands. Uh, he's the author of uh, the book um, Slaves and Highlanders, which we heard about uh, a few weeks ago now. And we're also welcoming Marcia Dunkley, who's helping um, advise and, and guide us as we move forward as well. And a special welcome to um, Dr. Jim Thakdorin, who's with us today, who's a great help and support to us, um, an advisor on how we take these Black History conversations forward. So the next thing is that because I'm in Australia, I have to say that um, we always start with a respect um, and I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently living. It's the Wunjiri Nation of the Kulin, Wunjiri people of the Kulin Nation. Their elders, past, present, and future. This land belongs to the sovereign people of the First Nations. This land was never ceded, it always was and always will be the land of the First Nations. I illustrate this behind to show you just how stormy it's been here. I live in the Dandenong Ranges and uh, yesterday this enormous cloud rushed towards us. Um, fortunately there wasn't too much damage but we've had exceptional damage this um, last winter, um, losing a lot of trees here in this, this area which is really difficult. All right, so uh, now I'm just going to move on to um, say that the thing that we need to really, well, <laughs> be interested in, and if you haven't heard about it, then you need to do some research. And that is that now we have the newest republic in the world, the Republic of Barbados. The PowerPoint that I'm showing you, um, I intend to post on our, our um, website. So there are links and interesting things, and I'll be coming back to this a little bit later on. So just nip down to the next bit. And just to say that uh, I want to welcome, especially today, um, Nicholas Radburn. Um, Nick from um, Lancaster University. He's going to be talking to us about the British firearms industry and the Atlantic slave trade. Now, I'm usually pretty hopeless on introducing people and ask them to introduce themselves, but as I've got your profile up here, Nick, I'll just say that um, in your profile, you say you're his, a historian of the Atlantic world with a particular focus on the transatlantic slave trade. Current book project examines the slave trading merchants in Europe, Africa and the Americas and show how their profit motivated decisions massively expanded the trade and powerfully shaped the experiences of enslaved people. It's really interesting because some of the things that we've been looking at have been commodities and the, the influence of commodities and trade. Um, and also Nick's the co-editor of the Slave Voyages Project, which is a digital memorial to the 12.5 million Africans who were forcibly transported through the slave trade. Um, and that website is just amazing. And I hope we might hear a little bit about that today as well. And uh, Nick's also developed a digital model of a slave ship that's used in museums and classrooms around the world. So extremely um, delighted to uh, to welcome you, um, Nick, that's absolutely fabulous. So uh, with no more ado, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks very much indeed. Great Liz, thank you. And thank you for having me and inviting me. I was really pleased to, um, to, to see your invitation and to join and, and, uh, and take this opportunity to present to you guys some of the work I'm undertaking, which builds out with my previous work on slave trading merchants. 
So my, my research up to this point is really focused on, this is what goes into that book that Liz mentioned, slave trading merchants, i.e. those people who own slave ships in Britain, African slave traders who sell enslaved people on the African coast, and then American slave traders who, um, who sell the captives when they arrive on the ship. So it, the book sort of looks at those three groups in combination. Where my research is moving beyond that book, though, um, through this uh, currently a side project, but it might become the main thing I work on for the next few years, is to look at another very key aspect of the slave trade that does connect, as you'll see in my presentation, into the story of slave trading merchants. And that's the goods that are, you, that are supplied into the slave trade uh, and that will then be taken to Africa to acquire enslaved people. Um, there are myriad goods that go into the slave trade, principally textiles, but also beads, metal wares, manufacturers, weaponry, as we'll see today. Uh, and I could have focused on, on, on pretty much any of those, but there's, as I'll show you today, there's a very interesting uh, aspect of firearms uh, in the way that it uh, is a clear manufacturing industry that's based in Britain, which is different from a lot of the other trades that feed the Atlantic slave trade, many of which are just bringing in goods from elsewhere and then re export them to Africa. Uh, but there's also a story here that shows how the slave trade really expands out of the places we principally associate with it. That's just sort of the key slave trading ports, such as Liverpool, Bristol, London, and to a lesser extent where I am in Lancaster, into the provinces and into rural areas that we just wouldn't really associate with the Atlantic slavery at all. Because as I'll show you today, a lot of the places associated with the firearms industry that directly connects to the slave trade, and I'll show you the ways that it directly links up today, uh, are in very remote places uh, that today sort of remember themselves as these places that are closed off to a great deal, that are picturesque, that don't have a great deal of industry, and that in many ways have no connection at all to that larger Atlantic world, and certainly no connection at all to Atlantic slavery. Uh, the other aspect of this project that, that really interests me is the way in which the slave trade drives British economic development, which is something that obviously people have become very much more interested in uh, recently in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and so questioning what is the role of Atlantic slavery in the making of modern Britain? And what I'll show you today is that if we look at the case of the firearms industry and we look at the case of the gunpowder manufacturing industry in particular, you can see a very clear example of a trade that was set up in response to the demand created by the slave trade in new areas of the country with money coming out of the British economy, often sometimes from the slave trade itself, but also from um, other areas such as textile manufacturing, as I'll show you, uh, being generate, uh, sort of profits being generated within the slave trade, within the, the process of the slave trade, and then that money being reinvested into the wider economy, especially in the 19th century. So this is a pretty, clear case, I think, of sort of Eric Williams' famous idea of the slave trade really driving industrialization, really driving economic development, especially in the era beyond the, the period of the slave trade. So I'll show you what the post-abolition story is here. Um, so it, it, to my mind, it's a pretty neat case study. And it's one that encapsulates well this, this whole other world that scholars haven't really looked at of what are the goods that are being produced for the slave trade, who produces them, how, how much money is made, and where does that money go? Right, so while gunpowder and to a lesser extent firearms, which I looked at today, comprise only about five to ten percent of the goods going into the slave trade, it gives you a glimpse of future directions of research that might be able to see the slave trade as a much, much bigger business than just sending out ships, uh, which is obviously something I'm focused on, and all those other branches we and the ownership of enslaved people as well in the Americas. There's this whole other world that's focused on manufacturing geared towards the slave trade. So Without further ado, I, I do have a, a set of slides here that will sort of walk you through that. So I'll get these going and make sure I can share my screen. I should have got my title slide when I gave my preamble, but that's okay. Uh, can you guys see this okay? Yep, fine, thank you. Great, thanks Liz. Okay, so I'll just make a start because I've already sort of given you my preamble on what, what I'm hoping to cover. Uh, so it, the important thing with the firearms industry and the supply of firearms and the supply of gunpowder to, to Africa is to understand what it is that happens in Africa in the era of the slave trade that creates this massive demand for weaponry and all the accoutrements that go with it, gunpowder, shot, flints, you know, all, all, all the things you associate with firearms. Uh, and that is largely to do with, with the way that African militaries are organized in this period and how those change once they're introduced to uh, weaponry which starts to flow into Africa via the slave trade. 
So this is obviously a broad generalization, but, but we can say pretty certainly because there's been a fair amount of studies on African warfare, most of it drawn from observations of um, African societies by Europeans, but also through archeological evidence, um, oral histories and so forth, that prior to about the mid 17th century, it depends on the region you look at, most uh, warfare is still being conducted with what we might call sort of traditional weaponry, okay? So javelins, uh, swords, knives, um, shields, bows and arrows, that kind of thing, right? Not firearm weaponry. And the reason is that the quality of European firearms is actually quite poor um, until the late 17th century. And, also, and, and that's especially problematic in the tropics, which obviously is where most of the area, the area of the slave trade is, in Atlantic Africa is. Uh, most of the weapons have to be fired with a match, which is a sort of lit fuse. That, that goes into the gunpowder, and that obviously is going to be problematic for people who are often um, operating in areas where there's heavy downpours. And there's also issues around rust and decay and all those things you would associate with it. So the although guns really arrive in Africa with the Portuguese in the early 16th century, they're not really adopted until the late 17th century. And the reason is that the quality of those weapons improves uh, sort of in tandem with uh, the quality of weapons improving in, in Europe. And one of the very important developments is the arrival of uh, flintlock muskets, which is a much more, I don't need to get into the sort of nerdy aspects of firearms history here, I won't be get too mired, but it's, the, it's a much more reliable lock that, is, that keeps the powder in case in a much better way, so it's much more reliable, especially in these tropical conditions. And so what we see in the late 17th century is the adoption, the very rapid adoption in some cases, of um, of uh, flintlock weaponry, especially in places like Ga Monday Ghana, Monday Benin, and then up in Upper Guinea as well. And you actually see the emergence of these sort of gunpowder societies, which are he heavily militarized uh, societies where they have a very professionalized army, uh, which becomes very successful at crushing adjacent people who are wield still wielding bows and spears uh, and shields and so forth. Uh, and therefore, that sort of dynamic really drives the slave trade. So if you look at um, the Gold Coast, Monday, Ghana, states like Asante emerge, which are, we might say, gunpowder empires, and they, they conduct through their military advantage almost 100 years of campaigning against their neighbours and become the dominant power in that region. And the people they conquer, they feed to the coast, and they exchange them there for a variety of goods, but also more guns and powder. And so what historians are really focused on is this idea of the, the so-called slave gun cycle, in which the sale of weaponry into Africa uh, destabilizes, militarizes areas, tips that balance of power, uh, feeding captives to the coast who gets exchanged for guns who can then be used to capture more people. And you can see how that becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. Right? And you see that here to a degree as well in the personalized account. And this always remember not to get too abstract with this, of what happens to, to individual people, and that is they're getting conquered by their neighbors who are armed with weaponry that they've acquired from Europeans. So here, Sang, who's an African uh, Akan man from that area of Ghana, uh, recounts when he's in Jamaica what happens to him. He says his village was attacked in the night. The attackers set fire to the houses, killed most of the inhabitants with guns, right, and cutlasses. The cutlasses will also come from the slave trade, particularly the old people, the young people like himself were taken prisoners and sold through various people before they were taken to the coast. And Sang was probably sold for a gun, ironically, and he was shipped to, to Jamaica. And we see that sort of story playing out to varying degrees along the coast. Now, the other important aspect of this story that really drives that demand for weaponry in Africa is one that historians haven't done nearly as much as they should on, and that's the non-military use of firearms. Today, you know, there's obviously billions of weapons in circulation. 85% of them are in private hands. They're not owned by militaries, right? And they're principally not being used, therefore, for military purposes. Gun weaponry isn't principally used, I would say, in any real period, principally by, um, by militaries. They're, they, they're often in private hands. So what are they doing there? And this is true of Atlantic Africa, just as anywhere else. And we see that in this excellent study that does actually look at this. Uh, this sort of non military activity, albeit in the colonial era in Nigeria. So, one of the variety of uses that guns can be put to elsewhere in, uh, when they're not being used by militaries, well, salutes, that means firing off guns at things like funerals and things, becomes a major part. They'll fire off hundreds of guns several times. 
hunting, of course, uh, big game and small game, elephants, gazelle, you know, all, all the different animals that you might encounter in Atlantic Africa. The protection of crops, so firing guns keep birds off, keeping time, weirdly. So they, you know, in colonial Nigeria, they use a, uh, a gun every hour to fire off to signal to people when the hour is. Guns are valuable, so they can be used as basic units of exchange. Prestige items, especially when they're associated closely with European trade and all the, the sort of luxury goods that flow through it, and religious items too. And you can see from the image that uh, Sahida Rinto, who wrote this excellent book on non-military uses of firearms shows, uh, the ownership of firearms becomes very wrapped up in masculinity and, and, and sort of culture in, in these areas of Atlantic Africa as well. Also self-defense, of course. This is especially, uh, I think, the big story that historians are missing, because if you look at actually the quality of weaponry that's being shipped to Africa, it actually tends to be fairly poor. I'll get into that a little bit when we look at um, gunpowder. Uh, but the quality of the weapons tend to be very low. The barrels are very poorly made. They're not proofed, which means they're not tested for their quality. The quality of the powder is the worst of any that's made. Uh, and so if they were to be used reliably by militaries, these aren't the sort of weapons they would import. Now that's not always the case. Places like Ghana, they import better quality weapons. But if you look at places like what becomes modern day Nigeria, they tend to be importing low quality weapons, low priced, uh, which would be by the standard of a European army, very unreliable. And that to me is a strong indicator that these uses, especially in particular areas of the Atlantic Africa, such as uh, Nigeria and others, uh, are probably more pressing and more important than those military uses that, that historians are fixated upon. Okay, whether it's to do with the military use or whether it's to do with the non-military use is kind of moot when we shift our focus to Britain, because ultimately what those combined add up to, and we can debate whether one's more important than the other, is a huge demand for, for arms and powder, right? And a huge demand for arms and power that means that whenever someone's being sold on the African coast into the slave trade by the late 18th century, they'll almost always be sold for a bundle of goods that includes weaponry. It includes a gun, several guns, and it includes sometimes, and it includes a volume of gunpowder to fire those weapons, and then flints and shot, which isn't something I'm going to look at here, but that's a whole other story too. So if we look at this Liverpool slave ship, which goes to Bonny in, in, in what's now modern day Nigeria in 1797. Uh, and we see a inventory of the goods they go out for to take 353 people, purchase 353 captives. We see 155 barrels of gunpowder. Each one of those barrels will have 100 pounds of powder in it. They look like this. 10,000 powder kegs, these little, little things, they decant the powder into it. And then that's what they use to trade for captives. And the reason is that these can be then, you know, used as sort of more, more tradable goods and also an individual person and an individual gun can use it to, 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 to fill it up. And then we see lots and lots of weapons. So 430 Spanish guns, they were probably British made in a Spanish pattern rather than a gun made in Spain, and 450 body guns. And that's interesting because what that shows you is they're making uh, specific guns for specific African markets. Right, the Bonnie guns are really bad quality because they're pretty probably being used for non-military uses. In places like modern-day Ghana, they'll be selling different types of weapons, which are much closer to those sort of weapons we would see in European militaries. But whatever way you cut it, a lot of arms and a lot of powder. And we see that as well if we look at the volumes of weaponry that are shipped to Africa over time. So this is just the British slave trade, right? And this is the number of people that are being shipped off in British slave ships. And this is the volume of gunpowder in blue, which is being uh, shipped to Africa in the same period. And you can see the trade largely moving lockstep. And also that the volume of powder being traded sort of per person gets, gets increasingly large over time. We don't have a similar trade statistics for guns. They often ship them and said, they just describe them as raw iron. So they weren't nearly as neat, but we know by the late 18th century, they're shipping about 200,000 guns a year just from Britain to Africa. And then the French and the Portuguese and others are shipping weaponry out too. So we're talking about a huge trade in firearms here and one which is intimately linked directly to the slave trade because those trade weapons are being traded almost entirely for enslaved people. So then the question is, where does that, how is that demand met? 
how do these British manufacturers satiate the increasing African demand for weaponry, which, which is obviously being channeled through the slave trade, through, through slaving ports in London, Bristol, Liverpool, with those ships going out to Africa with those cargoes. One important thing to note is if you look at where the firearm industry is in, say, the late 17th century, it's not out in the provinces. It's principally in London. And there's good reasons for that. As I'll show you soon when we look at gunpowder, that's very closely tied to other trades because of the precursors you need to make gunpowder. Uh, but also the gun manufacturing as well is also based around London because that's where the state is, right? That's where the military is based, the Navy, the Army, the Ordnance Board, all these people who put in large orders for weapons. And that's where Britain's principal merchants are who will be shipping out weaponry as well. Uh, so most of the of the trade of the manufacturing in, in weaponry, be it guns or powder, is in a sort of arc around London or in London itself. Okay, that changes significantly in the 18th century directly because of the slave trade, and that's because people like this guy, Samuel Galton Jr., who's a Somerset haberdasher, he's a Quaker, sets up new uh, man, gun, uh, firearms manufacturers principally in this place in Birmingham. Now, Birmingham is a key place for the, for the firearms industry right the way through to the 20th century, as I'll show you soon, uh, towards the end of this talk. Uh, but it has some, a lot of advantages that make it a good place to make weaponry. And that's because it has good access to those ports like Bristol, where you can ship things off. Uh, it has access to iron, which you obviously need to make the barrels. Um, and it's got lots of other trades and manufacturers that, that sort of connect up to it. So that work of making complex things like locks for the, for the guns, a lot of what else is done in Birmingham is making complex things out of metal too, okay? So Birmingham becomes this key center and it really starts to sort of peel away the firearms trade manufacturing from London. And the Londoners get very, very unhappy about this because what the kind of weaponry they're making in Birmingham isn't this, uh, especially for the slave trade, isn't these high quality weapons that meet certain quality standards that are sort of patterned on uh, the firearms being used by the British military, but low quality knockoffs, often with unproved barrels, often specifically to sort of African patterns and African demand. Uh, and they make them in enormous volumes as well. The way they make, uh, so as I was saying, about 200,000 a year are gonna be going to Africa by the late 18th century, most of those will be made. The way they make them is a sort of, cottage industry, it's not all centralized. So they, they put out the orders uh, to lots and lots of little manufacturers be they, who will be making either lot stock or the barrel. And then those are delivered and then assembled in more centralized facilities such as uh, Farmer and Gal Galton and Farmers, which is in the so-called gun quarter of Birmingham, which is in, in the Northern part uh, and remains named so today to, as a sort of symbol of its, of its previous gun making uh, tradition. The stocks come principally from uh, walnut, which is made it, which is harvested in uh, in the Mediterranean. The iron ore, um, it you know, is often produced in the Black Country and, and up in Staffordshire, but also often sometimes comes over from Sweden, which I know Chris Evans has written about. Um, and so you can see the ways that this is a quite a complex industry where you've got a lot of people connecting up to a lot of other trades as well. Okay, if you want more information on this, I really recommend um, Priya Satch's book, Empire of Guns, which is all about this one firm, the, the Galtons. So it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, for the remainder of this talk, though, I'll largely focus on gunpowder because that isn't an aspect that's been written on and, and, and it will still give you that, that story of, that's, that's very similar to what I've just explained for guns. Okay, so, so what about gunpowder? Gunpowder is obviously a key ingredient for guns because it's the thing you use to fire them. Like guns, the gunpowder industry is principally focused in the 17th century on London, in the Thames estuary. What you need to make gunpowder is water power, uh, for reasons I'll show you soon. Uh, and usually that, so they're, they're, they're usually constructing these sites on streams that feed into the Thames, often slightly remote from London, for the obvious reason that if these places blow up, you don't want to devastate a large portion of London. Um, so the early trade to Africa, which is itself largely going out of London until about 1700 when it moves out to the provinces is probably being fed by those gunpowder mills around London, which are set up principally to supply London's merchants, the Ordnance Board and all those other things I mentioned before. What we see in the 18th century, though, as the slave trade moves out to the provinces, first to Bristol in the 1720s and 30s, then up to Liverpool in the from 1740 onwards and to a lesser extent Lancaster, Lancaster is quite small, 
is establishment of five new gunpowder mills that are set up specifically to supply powder just to the slave trade. Right? That's the whole purpose of these places being set up. They're not set up sort of because there's mining in the area and they happen to also sell some powder to the slave trade. These places are set up because of that, the growing demand for, for powder in the slave trade. So Woolley, which is the first one, is established uh, down near, uh, near Bath, just to the east of Bristol in a sort of rural uh, gl glade, or sort of wooded, secluded little village. Uh, then Littleton, which is um, to the west, again, approximate to Bristol, is set up in the 1740s. Then a mill up the Mersey River from Liverpool at Thelwall uh, on the Cheshire side of the river. Sedgwick, uh, which is just down the road from, from Kendall in 1764. And then Haverthwaite, which is established just at the end of the 18th century, basically as, as to, to, because the demand for powder is soaring because of the fear of abolition. They set up a, a powder mill there specifically to, to supply that and profit by that increased demand for gunpowder. These are the partners of the, who founded each of these companies, and I've highlighted in bold those people who are themselves slave trading merchants. So as you can see, uh, each of the operations that was initially established proximate to Bristol and Liverpool uh, is basically, uh, basically established either entirely by people who own slave ships or mostly by, in the case of Woolley, by people who own slave ships. Even this guy, Isaac Bow, he, his, his direct relatives are slave traders, so, that, so you have that close connection. Uh, the stories I'll show you up here is slightly different, but we still have a connection to the slave trade via this guy, Joseph Farah, who's a former slave ship captain. For his long career, he slave captain sort of like a dozen slave ships in the 1770s, 1770s 80s, and 90s. And this guy, James King, who's the uh, son of a slave ship uh, surgeon. So in each case, we see people in the slave trade investing in the industries that, that feed it. So if we sort of break this down in simplistic terms, we have slave traders who are, who are establishing these gunpowder mills. So to give you one example, this guy, Ellis Cunliffe, who co-founds the Thalwell Works with his brother Foster and then two others, he is the scion of a big slave trading family that basically pioneers the Liverpool slave trade. His dad, Foster Cunliffe, the senior, uh, is one of the first people to ever fit out slave ships from Liverpool. And so his family, over the course of the 18th century, finances 65 slave trading voyages carrying 17,000 people into slavery. Uh, so this is a slave trading dynasty that's basically building one of these gunpowder mills to profit further by the slave trade. On the other hand, we see, if I just, I don't mean to keep popping back and forth, but the people who aren't involved, who are these other people? Well, they tend to be sort of gentry capitalists who don't invest in slave ships. And this is where that's the story of like who is involved in the slave trade, who profits by the slave trade, where, you know, uh, and how do we remember these people? Well, if you look at something like the Slave Voyages database, you'd never guess that people like these people ever invested in the, uh, in the slave trade or profited by it. But people like Christopher Wilson Jr., who invest in these gunpowder mills, remember their supply of almost all their products to the slave trade, uh, draws their capital from the um, Kendall woolen trade and, uh, and banking uh, by his dad, Christopher Wilson Sr., who we see a miniature of here. Okay, so gentry capitalists who are drawing their capital out of those more traditional industries that we associate closely with the British economic development, woolen manufacturing, sort of country trade, banking, and so forth. They're putting their money into the slave trade via these manufacturers and then profiting by it and drawing the money out. Okay, and we see that uh, with all these individuals I showed you on the other slide who aren't involved. So there's a way in which manufacturing for the slave trade really multiplies significantly the number of people that are connected to this business. Okay, so let's look at um, how these places operate. One important thing to note is that via these uh, gunpowder works, what we see is Africa being connected into a much wider world of trade uh, that's basically enabled by the expansion of the British Empire in this period. And this is true of other goods that's, that go into the slave trade, such as textiles, many of which are imported from India. So the reason that these gunpowder mills can be set up is because Britain's trading empire is expanding into other areas, principally into the Mediterranean in this period, and into the Indian Ocean. And that's because of the reasons because what you need to make gunpowder. Gunpowder is comprised of three ingredients, just three, which are 
incorporated in a, in a complicated process I'll show you in a second. Charcoal, 15%, that provides the fuel for, the, for it to, to explode. So, saltpeter, 70%, uh, uh, is basically the oxygen that fuels that fire. And brimstone, sulfur, 15% is what gives the spark, what makes it ignite and makes it explode. So the combination of those three ingredients together is how you get gunpowder. Now, as you can see here, almost all of those precursors, those ingredients, don't come from England. Only the charcoal comes from England. Those principally come from those foresty rural areas that are near to these gunpowder works, being in uh, southern, the South Lakeland region of what's now Cumbria, or the woody hills of Somerset and Gloucestershire, where these other mills are. Saltpeter is really the key. Saltpeter is really, really hard to get in England because it's basically derived from decomposing plant and vegetable matter, things like animal dung. And because it's quite cold and chilly here and the climate isn't, uh, you know, conducive to explosive growth of plants and animals like we see in the tropics, uh, England is perennially short of saltpeter throughout the 17th century. The big breakthrough comes when they expand the Indian tr trade by the East India Company in the late 17th and into the 18th century, where they really basically get hold of almost limitless supplies of saltpeter because huge amounts of it are produced in India by uh, in these kind of facilities. So they, 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 they basically put the earth, which is very rich in potassium nitrate, which is what really saltpeter is, in these big pots. Uh, leave them there to ferment, and then the liquid drains into other pots, and they go and boil this up to further refine it, and you get a sort of crude, rough version of saltpeter. And the East India Company ships thousands and thousands of bags of this over every single year in the 18th century uh, to London. Uh, so the reason why gunpowder mills can expand and the gunpowder production can expand in England is because saltpeter is suddenly much more abundant by the Indian trade. So in a weird way, um, African Africa is being connected to India via the gunpowder trade almost directly. Sulfur is only a relatively small proportion of the ingredients of gunpowder, but this again it, it, it is an interesting story. Uh, sulfur obviously doesn't really occur here naturally in England, so they have to find it elsewhere. And where they find it is in the volcanic islands of the Mediterranean. And the conditions in which the sulfur is extracted uh, in places like Sicily, where a lot of these, um, these sulfur mines are, is truly, truly hellish. I mean, the people who visit these mines describe them as literally hell on earth, because the people who are doing a lot of the mining are often children, and they're having to schlep these big 20 or 30 pound sacks of sulfur, which they've had to mine by hand uh, out of these mines. You can imagine the sort of conditions of a sulfur mine. It's literally that sort of hell on earth of fire and brimstone. Uh, they're working long days, they perish often, have very short lives, they're, they're in a sort of wage labour or bonded slavery. Uh, and so in a weird way that the misery of these children sustains the misery of the, of the enslaved because they're digging out the ingredients that will produce the goods that will be used to buy those captives. Okay, this again is made possible by the fact that Britain has a big trade with the Mediterranean, it's a trade that expands throughout the 18th century and those mines expand in response to the British demand for sulfur, both for uh, the gunpowder industry, but also the expanding textile industry, because sulfur is used, uh, sulfuric acid is used in the dyeing process in large quantities. So in sum, what you see here by looking at the single product is a much bigger world in which uh, Britain's other trades, which we often think is distinct from or separate from the Atlantic slave trade, uh, intersect with and make, and make the Atlantic slave trade possible because of, because it enables these goods to be manufactured, uh, especially the East India trade. Okay, so let's turn to the mills, turn to these companies and see how they operate. One thing to note is that we're talking about major manufacturing works here. We're not talking about a single building, a single factory, uh, you know, site where it's all done. Gunpowder has to be produced through a multi-stage process, each of which usually takes place in its own building which are often strung out along a river. And the reason is because you need power uh, in these facilities to drive these things, which are the incorporating mills. Because how gunpowder is made is you take those three ingredients, you refine them on site. Uh, you might see some of that here, the charcoal store, the saltpeter house, uh, and there might be somewhere else for sulfur as well. They, they refine each of them in separate buildings. They tumble them together into a sort of rough mix 
but then they go into these, which are the incorporating tunnels, where these stones go round and round automatically because they're driven by water. You see that in this image here on the right, that's a water wheel driving the incorporating mills until they're, 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 they're ground together. And then they go through further processing to sort of sift them and, and, and finish them and dry them, all of which takes place in other build, buildings and then put into barrels. So you need a cooperage, a lot of coopers producing thousands of barrels too. Collectively, all that requires space. So you see that here with the image at the top of a gunpowder mill uh, to, to lay these out, sort of two acres along a river, often rented from a local landowner or port outright, and it needs money and lots of it. So I know from looking at the financial accounts for these companies, because most of them are extent, you need about £10,000 to set up one of these mills just for the fixed capital and to get off the ground. That's a huge amount of money. That's about two slave ships or the equivalent of a plantation in Jamaica by the late 18th century. They then need further capital to, to basically sustain the fact that they're selling a lot of this powder on credit and to buy in all those precursor ingredients, which are quite expensive, uh, and bring them up from, uh, from, from London. So we're talking about uh, major manufactories uh, that, that, that absorb a lot of capital. They don't, interestingly, though, absorb a lot of workers because they don't actually need them, because this is a largely automated process, you only need about six or seven people working on these sites. Uh, about four or five of them being so-called powder men who work in the works and a couple of coopers. So this isn't an industry that absorbs hundreds or thousands of, of workers in this area. Okay, so they so basically what they do is they buy in the precursors, they process them in the mills, they barrel them up, and then they ship them off to the slave trading ports. And so what we also see by looking at this case study is a way in which these powder mills, which are themselves in these remote little secluded spots in the countryside because of the nature of gunpowder is risky, there might be an explosion. You also need water power, so it has to be somewhere near a river. Um, <coughs> you know, so, so, and you also need access to charcoal. So you have to put these in, in rural areas. It wouldn't be uh, able to set up. Uh, so they're in rural spots, but then they connect up as well through the need to get the powder out and the, and the precursors in to a lot of other rural spots, uh, which we don't really think of as being associated at all with Atlantic slavery either. So if we look at the two gunpowder works that are in the South Lakes, which is just over the bay that I can see out the window here, opposite Lancaster, to sort of south of what's now the Lake District National Park, that's Sedgwick here on the top right, and Haberthwaite further west, they get their precursors in and get the powder out via these places, Milnthorpe and Arnside for Sedgwick and Olverston uh, for Haberthwaite. And what they do is they bring in on, on, on sort of sloops, uh, the, or the, the sloops come and go out in and out the bay and then little lighters and you know, shallow bottom craft take the, the materials up and down these rivers and navigate the sort of muddy sandy soils. So if you drive around this area now, it looks sort of like this, quintessential English countryside, uh, that untouched vision of a Lake District that's all about Wordsworth and, and sheep and rolling hills and that kind of thing. You couldn't imagine boats uh, going up and down these rivers, carrying a huge amount of cargo, much of it connected to the, to the slave trade. And this is connected to the slave trade. This is goods that are, that are just to buy people. It's not for other uses in this period I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, so, and also, um, the, as I'll show you as we go through these places, get heavily developed by this trade too. So there's a whole story here of um, the, that history of Atlantic slavery and how we remember it, and, and it's web stretching much, much further than we think, and going much beyond places like Liverpool, London, and Bristol into the countryside. Something I'm sure you guys have looked at when you look at these woolly fellows here with your sheep project. Okay, so they produce the powder, they, they bring the precursors in via this trade network and they take it and then they take the finished powder out and it goes to these places, to Liverpool and Bristol, but from these mills. And what they do is they construct powder mills on the River Avon and on the Mersey to basically store this powder. So the powder isn't brought into Liverpool, it's brought just to the, to the powder magazine that's on the, um, uh, on the sort of mouth of the Mersey River just before it goes out into the Irish Sea. And it's stored there in a special facility that is set up by the powder makers. And then what they do is they have an agent or agents, each firm has an agent in each of these slave trading ports, and they work, try and make sales to the slave trading merchants in the town. 
And when they've made a sale, they tell the guy who runs the powder magazine, okay, I've sold 200 barrels of powder to so-and-so's slave ship, and he's going to collect it. And so this is the records of one of these, um, uh, just a sample of the records I'm looking at. This is the magazine account for one of these uh, works, the Haberthwaite works, and you can see it's 1804 at the top. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Uh, and this is the dates down here, and each of these is a slave ship. This is all the names of the ships here. And this is the names of the merchants. And this is the number of barrels of gunpowder that they're taking out to Africa, right? And you can see the sheer scale of the trade. They're selling about 3,000 barrels of powder in this six month period in 1804. This is just this one firm. Right? So this is substantial. And, and pretty much every sort of every couple of weeks, a ship's coming up the river collecting powder and they're going out to Africa with it on board. The quality of the powder, which well, I can talk a bit more about, especially in the QA if you're interested, is indicated here too. They indicate it by F, double F, and triple F. The stuff going to Africa is F because it's the lowest quality. So this is how you know that this is African powder that's for the slave trade. This other powder is for so-called ship defense to fire the cannons and the muskets and everything on board. So that's really the process of how these companies work. I'll get to that next slide in a second. They, they're buying in material principally from London that connects to East India, the Mediterranean, then some locally charcoal, processing it on site, shipping it to the same imports, and the ships are taken out to Africa. And that just goes round and round in a circle. And those agents in, in the slave trade imports write back to the mill saying, hey, you need to increase production or scale it down depending on the demand for the slave trade. I see all that in the letters. They're saying, hey, um, we think there's going to be a lot of slave ships going out soon, so you need to work the mill night and day for six days a week to make sure enough powder is being produced because we can sell every single barrel that's being produced. It's that kind of close link between the slave trade and this powder industry. So how much money do they make from this? Uh, well, fortunately, we can work it out quite clearly because the accounts for all these different powder mills are extant. It's one of the only, um, I would say it's probably the best documented of all the goods that are produced for the slave trade. The gunpowder is probably the one that has the best accounts and most detail on how this trade operates. So if you look at those accounts, you can actually see what's the sort of annual rate of return on capital. How does it change over time? And the answer is it's pretty good. The slave trade investment in slave ships, the average is about 10% a year, right? That people make on investing in slave ships. This is one of these powder works, the woolly powder works down at Bristol, where we have the best sort of long-term view of their profitability. This is 5%, 10%, 15%, et cetera, going up the, the uh, y-axis, and this is the year. And you can see they never make a loss. Yeah, they have bad years, especially when there's water, when you know there's embargoes and things, they can't ship their powder. But generally they make good money, especially towards the end of the 18th century when that demand from Africa is really booming, when they're making 30%, 25%, 20% a year. If we look at the Sedgwick Company, one of those up in the, the South Lakes, we don't have profitability, but we have the guy who owns its annual account showing how much is this business worth. 1788 is worth about 15,000 pounds by abolition. Uh, it's quadrupled in value. And he actually builds a new mill downriver to increase production in 1799, which is to, to increase production going into the slave trade. So we can see again here, this gives you a glimpse into a world that is intimately connected to and part of the Atlantic slave trade where some people are making a huge amount of money. And it's not something that people are historians have looked into at all or considered when they think about these legacies of Atlantic slavery, that there's vast amounts of wealth being generated in the supplying of the slave trade, uh, not just in the fitting out of slave ships. Where does that money go? Well, we can actually trace it pretty easily because we know who the investors are. I know who the investors are, as I've showed you before. And a lot of the times the accounts of these powder works uh, are kept by individuals, so they'll be part of a bigger financial portfolio. As with a lot of people, uh, 18th century businessmen, their, their goal isn't to um, get to 70 years old, having a long career, and then do more business. They want to retire, and they usually want to retire in considerable splendor. So we see a lot of the money coming out, these powder works going uh, into landed estates. So this, um, this is an estate in Surrey, 
owned by Henry Strachey, who owns the uh, part owns of Woolly Gum Powder Works. He's interestingly also very heavily engaged in the East India Company, and at least some of the money goes into re, you know, renovating, extending, etc. His family seat, uh, but he draws out a lot of money from the from the Powder Works. We know that from his letters. So at least some of it goes into this estate. The Cunliffe family, who um, who finance that Thalwall works up the Mersey River, they buy this place and retire basically in the 1760s. And they're just silent partners of the gunpowder works. They just take money out of it periodically as dividends. Uh, Acton Park, which is in Denbighshire, uh, the seat, as it says here, of Sir Foster Cunliffe, who is one of the owners of the Thalwall works and is in the accounts of someone who's earning a lot of money uh, from the company. So as always, and this is a story I always see with slave traders, land, big houses, the countryside again, is a key story here in terms of where the money goes. The other important thing to note is because of where these powder mills are often sited in little rural villages, which are often sort of hamlets before the powder mills there, uh, they actually transform these little rural communities um, over time through having the business there through having wealth moving through the business, through having workers there who are earning money, through having someone who works on site and owns the powder mill, often will live at the powder mill and, and then buy up a lot of the land around it. So Thalwall, which is that place up the Mersey River, if you go on there, uh, look at their sort of heritage walk, they basically say, oh, John Stanton, uh, who was the guy who owned the powder mill, he transformed our village. Without him, this place would be nothing doubled its size, he bought up a lot of the houses there, the, what's now the school he constructed, what was uh, now the major pub here you see on the left used to be owned by him. Uh, what they don't say is this was driven by wealth generated by the side trade, they just say the gunpowder industry really transformed this town. But I know looking at the accounts that transformation was enabled by supply in the slave trade. Likewise Sedgwick, little town just down from Kendall where they, where they had that mill that I showed you the map of before, the parish council has a lot of information on their website about the importance of the gunpowder industry to transforming Sedgwick. But what they say is, oh, they, these gunpowder works were set up basically to supply the mines in the area, the canals, the railroads. They never mention Atlantic slavery. But they say, in a similar way to Thelwall, without the gunpowder works, this place wouldn't be what it is today. And you can see that just by looking at it, because the guy who owns the gunpowder works there puts up this big house there. Uh, which stands today, uh, and, the guy, and, the, and this family are known as the sort of people who collectively transformed Sedgwick into the place it makes today. But that transformation again, at least initially with the establishment of the gunpowder mill, driven by the slave trade. What else? There's got to be a story that goes beyond land, right? And there is, and that's because, uh, especially if we look at those two works in the South Lakes, uh, I'm just going to keep an eye on time, uh, the money that comes out of them, or at least the two key partners who set them up, establish a very important bank in Kendall, and that bank um, helps to finance a lot of the development of Cumbria in the 19th century and, and the area around the, what's now the Lake District. So there's canals that are financed through, through money coming out of this bank, Kendall Bank, <coughs> the textile industry in the area, and mining up in the lakes, up in places like Coniston, it's basically a copper mine here. So the availability of wealth via uh, the Kendall Bank, which as I say is, is, is a partnership between two of the, the two guys, so the two gunpowder works, really provides capital that really helps transform that area uh, and increase its economic prosperity. What about the mills themselves, right? They are there throughout the era of the slave trade up till 1807 but they are still there once the slave trade ends. So how, what, what's the story of these places that manufacturers are set up for the slave trade uh, after abolition? You might think, well, they close their doors because they've lost their raison d'etre. And they certainly come close because as you can see from this graph, which shows the volume of powder that they're set, the value of powder that they're at work in the, one of the works in the South Lakes, the Haberthwaite Mill is selling. After 1807, their sales to Liverpool, which is basically the slave trade, crashes, right? And their domestic sales, which had always been kind of flat and kind of negligible, don't really pick up that much. But what we see if we follow this story beyond 1807 is that they're able to move somewhat effectively into supplying mines, into supplying uh, railroads, into supplying canals, 
all of which are using gunpowder for blasting, because to do this kind of heavy construction work with associated industrialization, you need gunpowder to blow through obstacles, to, to blow deeper shafts and deeper mines. Uh, there's also a whole market for sporting powder to be used by huntsmen and so forth. Uh, interestingly, they don't supply the military for reasons I can get into in the Q&A if you're interested. Uh, but they do actually sort of, in a peculiar way, fuel the Industrial Revolution through their product right, and sustain it as well as their, their founders supplying some of the capital for this transformation too. The other important thing is um, that those markets in Africa don't just disappear overnight. Well, they do to a degree after the slave trade, but they actually recover. And here we see another story where there's a connection to industrialization too, uh, and to the prosperity of Britain in the 19th century. And that's that trade with Africa that's not for enslaved people, but that's for so-called legitimate products, principally in the case of Liverpool's African trade, uh, palm oil. Uh, palm oil is used as for things like is used as a fat as it is now in things like soaps, margarines, foods. Uh, but also it's used to lubricate industrial machinery. Okay, so it's an important lubricant. And what's palm oil exchanged for? Well, in part, it's exchanged for gunpowder. So if we look at this, is the sales of that work at, works at Habithwaite, their sales at Liverpool. Here it is 1807, just before abolition. Abolition comes, boom, it basically disappears and it flatlines. Their sales for Africa are pretty much gone, right? But 20 years later, we see a big recovery, and that's because they're now supplying gunpowder to, to the um, to the palm oil trade, to Liverpool traders who are taking it once again, hundreds of barrels of gunpowder on their ships to Africa. So, uh, so what we see is these mills, uh, which were set up to sustain the slave trade, go on to help sustain that trade with Africa into the 19th century, and, and to acquire those goods that will themselves, the tropical goods that will themselves sustain industrialization uh, and economic development in Britain. Where are we at? To, where are they today? Well, the interesting thing with these mills is that because they were big industrial sites, that most of them still stand in some form or another. Now, some of them are almost complete. Some of them are basically a ruin, uh, but they're still there. But most of them, you, if you visit them, you would have no indication at all that there was any story here of Atlantic slavery. They're really hidden away. So, for example, if you go to Woolley, which is that place near Bath, it's a bit of a trek because it's on these horrible country roads. It's really tucked away. And it's basically a farmhouse now. It operated into the 19th century, but shuttered after the uh, Napoleonic Wars. Littleton, which is the other works down in Brist near Bristol. Um, I was, it, you can find it on Google Maps. So I thought, well, I'll pay it a visit. This place was mothballed just before abolition because the Bristol works weren't able, were barely together squeezed out by the works up in Liverpool and they consolidated all the production at the Woolley site. So I thought I'd visit it, but it's now behind a big gate, but it's a private residence. So it's basically like, the old buildings that were the gunpowder mill are now houses with people living in them. I did get a good sense driving to it, though, just how remote these places are. It took like 40 minutes driving in through little hamlets and towns and through sort of rural glades to get out to it. And it's nowhere near anywhere that you would associate with, um, with the Atlantic slave trade. It's really, really rural. I'm sure the people who live in this area just think of themselves as being sort of cut off country people who don't have any connection to this history. Uh, that's slightly the case uh, of the Fellwall works too. This is what that area looks like now. And the reason is it used to be on the sort of marshy estuary of the Mersey River, set slightly away from Fellwall, the village, even though the workers and the person who ran the gunpowder site, as I've mentioned, lived in the town. It blew up in the 1850s, like, a, like it's always the risk with these gunpowder works, <laughs> and was completely flattened. They didn't rebuild it. And now, as you can see, it's new build Landia. Now, what's interesting is these houses are built on something called Powder Mill Lane, which is the site, you know, a road or, or the area around where the powder mill used to be. So we still have that association with gunpowder in this area. Again, though, stripped of any connection or any taint of slavery. The Sedgwick Works, uh, one's just down the road from Kendall, uh, up the river, they built another site in the 19th century to supply those mines, all those things I, I, I described. But the old site that supplied the slave trade was demolished in the 19th century. So this is all that's left. You can see some of the weir that, and then the mill race that powered the works, but, but no buildings. The best preserved of the sites, though, is this one, which is the one at Habithway in South Lakes, uh, which is, uh, you can see these substantial stone buildings built in that sort of very distinctive stone of the Lake District. 
the clock tower, which was erected in the 19th century. Um, and this place operated well into the 20th century, uh, still producing gunpowder. It was in disuse until the early 2000s, and now it's been turned into offices. It's called the Clock Tower Business Center. But once more, that story of slavery is sort of gone from the site. And actually, historians who write about this site, local historians who write about these sites, are very eager not to talk about the fact that they were set up to supply the slavery. They usually describe them as being places that were set up to supply mines, uh, another sort of legitimate industry in this area. Uh, I haven't said a great deal about guns because, because Priya's book's so good and it's out there, but as I said, I'm happy to talk about the Q&A, but also because my research lately has been focused on so much on the gunpowder aspect. That's what I'm sort of doing right now. But the story of guns is somewhat similar. You see these, gun these um, firearms uh, manufacturers, including Galton's, merging fairly seamlessly into the 19th century world of manufacturing and trade, especially in the case of the Galtons by supplying firearms to the state uh, in the Napoleonic Wars. And we see a real blossoming of the, of the firearms industry in Birmingham in the 19th century so that we have hundreds of firms operated by the mid 19th century uh, and gun making continuing into the 20th century. As with the story of most British manufacturing, that fell into decline, you know, after the Second World War. And actually, what was historically the gun quarter, Marcy will know this better than I, so she'll have to correct me. <laughs> uh, I think they demolished a lot of it to build a ring road through it, but it's retained its name. You can still see the proof house where they used to proof the tower barrel, the barrels yeah. that were for the guns. Um, and there are several sites that are still associated with the gun trade. Yes. The Galton family themselves, though, oh, oh, and they're still sort of artisan makers who are trying to continue that tradition. I found that picture just this morning of someone still in Birmingham making guns in that sort of traditional way. The Galtons themselves, though, who profited so enormously off of selling firearms to Africa, uh, established themselves as a very respectable um, Victorian family, as did actually all these people who set up these, these firearms companies. So uh, Samuel Galton's son uh, is a major scientist. He writes a big book on them. Um, on birds, and then this guy, his the son of the son, Samuel Galton's grandson, is Francis Galton, who's a really famous scientist and eugenicist in the in the um, in the late nineteenth century, but well, very very well known figures in Victorian society, and certainly not people who were stained by their ancestors' direct connection to selling firearms into the into the slave trade. Okay, uh, I think that's. I think that's me. So I'm happy to take any and all questions that you guys might have. I'm also happy to discuss anything else that might interest you about uh, the slave trade or anything else I work on, the slave voyages database. I'm, I'm open, I guess. I'll bring some tea. Well, well, thank you so <laughs> much, Nicholas. I'm going to hand over to Marcia in a minute because she's, I'm sure, got some points that she wants to bring up. But I'd just like to, to welcome, and thank you, it's an excellent presentation. Um, just like to welcome Bernard Janke from Kingston, Jamaica, um, who's the director of the um, African Caribbean Institute and um, the uh, Jamaica Memory Bank. Bernard will um, introduce, <laughs> introduce himself later. And Lisa Gabbert, who's um, uh, a researcher and she's um, based in Austin in Texas at the university there. So um, no, welcome to you. Um, Marcia, do you want to take the first? Yes, please, absolutely, wow. Yeah, um, so what you've what I've done is I've created um, a walk, a heritage history walk around the gun quarter of wow. Birmingham, um, basically highlighting a huge amount of the things that you've had in this presentation. It's like a memory lane thing when I've been up till, till three o'clock in the morning putting this together. <laughs> One of the aspects of this that thank goodness I've watched this was the whole issue of gunpowder. I've concentrated both, you know, specifically on the actual gun itself, but obviously the gunpowder without that, it's, it's, no, it's obsolete, it's no good. And I can only say thank you so very, very much because it's given me now um, uh, an extra dimension to this war. But for me to do that, I'd actually um, like to credit yourself for researching 
this aspect <coughs> of it. So I don't know if you'd like to um, meet um, separate to this, um, what I'd call uh, our dialogue here, separately in a different meeting. So I can show you, it's a very much, you show me yours, I show you. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> well, I, should have, I, should have, I should have noted, I'm writing this, this mm. up. Um, I envisage this as sort of two papers, one that looks at the manufacturing side, that's okay. what I'm writing up at the moment, and that you've just sort of seen, and that will be done very soon, so I can provide you that in, in sort of written format. But I'd love to meet you. Okay. So I'm also going to get myself down to Birmingham at some point. So maybe I can join you on that one. And come on, oh, I, ah, oh, brilliant. I mean, yeah. please do, please yeah. do, um, whenever. I will drop everything else to protect <laughs> That's great, thank you. I mean, <laughs> one, you... Thing, one thing that you, you really teased out there is the ways in which you might think these two things, because they marry, so they, they, they go together, right, guns yeah. and powder, that the story will be the same, that they're somehow made by the same people in the same facilities. What yeah. you see is how that African demand stimulates different branches of the in this, of British industry, yeah. different groups of people who can profit by it, different sites that can yes. be connected to it. You know, it really has that sort of multiplier effect. Um, and, that, and that's before we get into the fact that these things require flint, which is probably made in Wales, I would guess there's a lot of flint deposits down there, shot, which is made yeah. of lead. Interesting to find out where the lead comes from. You know, there's all these other accoutrements that go with these weapons that um, that all connect up and that all would have a similar story to this, I'm sure. Wonderful. I'm so um, eager. I am. I'm sending you my contact details. Now. I mean, yeah, I send my do, contact yeah. details to anybody, everyone, anyway. Uh, please contact me. But yes, it's uh, wonderful. Brilliant piece of work you've done. Very impressive. Thanks, Marcia. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. Yes, thank you. I think if I can just say, this is fascinating about what we've done, and then I'll come to you, David. I can see you are nodding away there. Um, is that we bring in these sessions people together <laughs> who've some got, you know, amazing academic backgrounds and research um, credentials like Nick, <laughs> along with others of us who didn't like history at school and have had to learn all these things ourselves um all sorts of people from very different backgrounds and activists are actually doing something to help people better understand black history mm. and marcia is just so strong on on that mm. um david you wanted to come in with a comment yeah thanks very much. that that was that was incredible thank you and it's it's a, it just opened my eyes to to whole aspects of, of the slave trade I hadn't thought about before. I'm particularly interested because I because I live in a rural area in the north of Scotland, a very small community called Cromarty. I'm interested in the way in which the, the slave trade and, and, and the trade to the slave plantations um, does have that impact in rural areas in ways in which people have now completely forgotten. So from the 1770s, the principal industry of Cromarty was the manufacture of bagging uh, which was then used um, for for cotton and coffee, um, the the cloth the, the from from Baltic hemp, so material from the Baltic shipped in to the north of Scotland, spun and woven here, shipped down to London, and then used in in trade with the West Indies. And it's it was so and that was in in a community that now is eight hundred people. Uh, in the 1770s that was employing over 800 people in, in manufacturing sacks and bags so 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 you're seeing the same thing happening with gun with with gunpowder it is that's that's really fascinating and um, th th there was one very specific thing i wanted to ask you and, and it was you know, particularly with the abolition of the the african the transatlantic african slave trade were any of the the merchants involved with gunpowder diversifying into plantation ownership um, and I, I'm asking that particularly because I know there was a plantation Ulverston in Guyana, eh, on, on, in Berbice in, in Guyana, that that's Bolton. created, sorry? Was that John Bolton, the, the Ulverston guy? Um, John, John, um, John Bo it, yes, John Bolton's involved with it, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's, yeah. Um, so, no, just, so just interesting if, if, there, if, if you are, I mean, the answer sounds like it might be yes, if, there's, if that there is that diversification. 
No, actually, the, not really. The, the main area of diversification you see is into um, some of the industries I've shown you, which which are into more of what we associate with the traditional British industry that isn't associated with the like banking, canals, mining, all the other things. Uh, that's obviously there. Land and, and all that, that I showed you too. But the main area where these people are investing back into is other mercantile pursuits, including the slave trade. So it's not that they get all that money from the slave trade and say, okay, now I'm going to serve a gunpowder mill and I'm going to stop being slave trade. They usually sort of do both at the same time often, especially the people down in Bristol. And the reason is because um, they basically, their sort of share in the slave ship is often the, the powder. You know, they can say, well, I'll just give you the powder and we'll, we'll call it quits on my investment. Um, plantation ownership, not so much, to be honest. I haven't seen, um, I'd have to go back through my sort of list of investors, but I'm not aware of any of them who own actually enslaved people in America. And one of the interesting things with this is the people who, who own the gunpowder works can position themselves sort of slightly aloof from the whole thing, even though, mm -hmm. and, and you know, he, so like this guy, Christopher Wilson, who he doesn't own slave ships, his dad is a Kendall um, textile magnate, but who, who's legislized, so we know that he trades, and he does trade some of his cloth to Virginia and Maryland, but his main customers are Britain. He's not someone who's connected to the Atlantic slavery. So you would look at him and think, well, he's the sort of quintessential example of a British businessman who's family wealth isn't connected to Atlantic slavery. He's not connected to Atlantic slavery because there's no slave ships, there's no enslaved people. But his letters are all, you know, and there's hundreds of them, while he's owning this gunpowder work, saying the slave trade is doing X, so we need to do Y. I think there's going to be lots of slave ships filling up from Liverpool, so we need to step up production. The slave trade is going to drop, so we need to stop production. What's happening in London with abolition? And then after abolition, he's saying, oh, wasn't it great that the slave trade ended because it was such a horrible business, and I, you know, I didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, and the guy had made a fortune off the back of selling gunpowder into the slave trade. So there is a, way, a weird and peculiar way that they... I guess you see this. You see this with Galton too, to agree as a as a gun maker, they, who's a Quaker too. They're sort of saying all I'm doing is making products, and where these products go is sort of not really on me. You know, that that's up to the use, the end user kind of thing. Um, and I think we we could obviously look at that and say that sort of doesn't wash, to to say the least, right? You can't. <laughs> uh th th these people are implicated almost as directly as the people who, who, who own the slave ships or own the slave people in the Americas because they're definitely producing a product that they know for a fact is going to be traded for slaves in Africa or used to shoot people or, or conquer people or do all the other things we associate with enslavement in Africa in the case of the gun makers. Um, but yes, David, to answer your question, um, no, I'm not aware of anyone owning enslaved people. I guess because they make sufficient money in Britain through this enterprise that they don't feel the, the need to, or because of that, what I was just telling you, that they see themselves as somehow a step removed from that whole world of enslavement, uh, even though they're directly connected to it. By the way, it's great to meet you, David. I've been following your work for a long time, although I haven't had a chance to read your Slaves and Highlanders book yet, but I'm gonna to get to it in this, soon. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Well, it's great as well that we've got, got colleagues from Scotland, um england uh now the lancaster area that's really good um wales um and next week we've got a colleague coming from ireland um <laughs> uh, who's uh, written about uh, slave links with mayo so that'll be very interesting right are there any other points that anybody wants to raise Gwyneth wants to, Gwyneth. Point to thank you yes thank you that was absolutely fascinating uh, and I know that it, the thing is connection with slavery, but um, the the, the uh, wars with the Native Americans in the U US, would they also have um, been big traders in firearms? And That's the other branch of, of this trade, basically. So, <laughs> although interestingly, not the, the powder makers I've looked at aren't selling gunpowder to the American trade, I'm presuming the American mills do, but there's a whole other firearms trade which has a quite a similar story in which guns have been sold to Native Americans along with gunpowder shot, all the stuff that goes with it, um, and fueling very similar things that I've talked about. So the emergence of sort of gunpowder empires, 
the complete upending of sort of balances of power among native militaries and polities, that sort of slave gun cycle I've talked about. People who are studying the Americas are talking about look at use a similar device. Same thing. I used to live in New Zealand and um, the Maori who, are, who have a similar history too, right? Weaponry flows in, and and there's these the so-called musket wars happen. So so um, in which we see very similar things and in, in enslavement rising. Um, what I think where I'd like to go with this ultimately more sort of medium or long term would be to do a more of a comparative study to look at how these firearms impact African societies and Native American societies and perhaps societies in the Pacific. Because I think historians are sort of asking the same questions of what happens to these weapons and how they use and putting them in conversation with each other and comparing them, I think it might be a useful way of looking at it in a new way. I do think though the volume, there's a really good book on this, by the way, it's called Thunder Sticks, I, call it, I think, which is all about the firearm trade to Native America. I, think I recommend it's an easy, pretty easy read by terms of some academic writing. Uh, but he shows that the volume of weaponry going to Native Americans is quite small compared to going to Africa. That's what I sort of saw reading through the lines. And it's because the population of Native America is quite low compared to the population of societies in Atlantic Africa. Um, but significant nonetheless, and, and, and a very important history, to say the least. Um, Nick, can I just ask you um, either to put the names of the books and the authors in the chat or to... Yeah, um, sure. Because uh, you said there was a good book on guns, so that would perhaps be the easiest way, and then we can, uh, folks can have a look at that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Are, that, that's been absolutely fantastic. Um, I just want to um, especially welcome Bernard Janke. Bernard, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Very much so. That's Quite good. fascinating. Right. Well, we're, we're pleased that you're able to, to join us again. And we did enjoy your presentation about the, uh, the work of the Jamaica Memory Bank. But it's all um, these small, small, well, small and yet huge ways that we're finding that in order to engage in the transatlantic slave trade, there were so many commodities and it's really interesting and to see how, how those products um, also involved an awful, you know, um, all sorts of different resources. I'm not being very clear here. Right, so lovely, Bernard. Uh, that's great. And Lisa um, has joined us from Texas. Lisa, are you there? I am, yes. Hello, Liz. That was wonderful, Nicholas. It is so interesting to see how everything that is discussed each week has uh, these tentacles, these threads that just extend and continue to draw more people and more industry and areas of the world in together. So thank you for, for sharing. I really, really loved that. Well, thanks, Lisa. I really appreciate it. Right. Lisa's particular interest is uh, the impact of the wool trade around mm. the world. And she's she, we won't go into detail on that. But um, I'm just looking uh, Alice. Very apt, because I'm surrounded by wool. I'm not sure you can see, right. but this is, this yeah. is my wife's wool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yes. pictures of sheep. <laughs> he, said, he said in one of your emails that your wife, your wife. Yeah, really exactly. <laughs> so now. so um, Lisa, um, I'm going to introduce you to Alison as well. And we're going to talk some more with Nicholas, because Nicholas comes from the area of the UK, I don't know if you know where Lancaster is, but it's that area where it's near to Peniston and Kendall and 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 Liverpool, so all that those trade areas. So thank you very much indeed, Lisa. Um, Audrey, um, you you've shared today, but if I can go into the PowerPoint presentation, I think we can pick up a whole lot of other things. But Anne Marie, um, anything particular you wanted to add for that? Uh, no, um, just. Thank you very, thank you very much. I don't know how I got the invite, but this is my first visit to uh, <laughs> to these zooms, and I'm just sorry that I've missed that I've missed uh, previous zooms. But I will be attending from now on because, um, yeah, as I say I'm, I'm a I'm a London guide, and I've just started doing Black History walks here in London, 
and uh, some of the inf some of the information that I've, that I've gleaned today will certainly go towards um, maybe another one of my walks, putting together another one of my walks, maybe around something like that based here in 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 London. Mm, that's great. Well, if I can say, Amory, I'm really mm -hmm. pleased that you're joining us from London because we don't often get colleagues from London. <laughs> tend to be the rural types in Scotland, Wales, um, uh, Midlands of, of England. And um, so that's really good. Uh, Audrey, do you want to say something? Just Thank you, on, on that, and that wasn't what I was going to say before, but on that point, it's true because there's so much black history and, you know, history like this all over mm -hmm. the country. We know, I, I just wanted to ask, had Alison had a talk with you before this, before this programme started? Yes. Yes, just I, couldn't, I couldn't understand why she was keeping silent now because this is one of the things she's been focusing on, you know, all the how all these different trades fitted into Yorkshire. And I've been looking at Yorkshire and all the um, down the dales and all that, you know, in the um, remote areas, the connections. So that's something that we're interested in. And I, as I say, I couldn't understand why Alison was quiet, but I now I realize she's spoken first. But yes, I think the other thing is that we, that we need to connect up with people in London much more because yeah. All the research on black history, so much of it is done there because there's so many research facilities, but there's people like us, as you say, in all the rural areas doing things and, and it can add to what's being, being discovered. I think that's really exciting because we're looking at, at how we're going to be able to better teach black history in schools. And one of the things is for um, schools to look at their own local history. So Audrey and I, and I think Helen, we've been talking about um, if we could um, look at um, the black history in a particular area. So you could have black history in Cumbria, you could have black history in Suffolk, you can have black history, looking at the stories in the different places and the cities as well. So that's something, and uh, I'll, I'll share the screen now. So is there anything else you particularly want to ask Nicholas? If not, we can, can, and if you can stay with us, Nicholas, for a little bit longer, we'd love that. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's fine. Can I, just, can I just ask, I saw, the, I saw your uh, email address at the beginning. Is it okay to, in, to email you about a particular query if we have them later? Yeah, and that, that goes equally for anyone else. Feel free to drop me a line and ask anything big or small. I'm, I'm yeah. here to help. It's to do with the same point. The Slave Voyages database, that's something that I sometimes have difficulty finding what I want on there, so yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah, get in touch, I can help you out with that. Um, I can run the site, so I can give you... Oh, that's great. I think if, if folks have a look at the Slave Voyages website and get your head around it, um, it is a fantastic research resource. Nick, I'm not going to ask you to talk about it more now, although I'd love to. Um, we'll just... Uh, just move move through. What was an interesting point that I picked out quite quickly, and I, I took a screenshot, uh, was the the top British slave trading families. You know, for the, that that's the level of that you can um, get get information. It's just just amazing. So uh, that was that one. This is was just the Black Heritage Walks Network. I don't expect you to read this, but Black Heritage Walks Network. You can look up their their website. Um, blackheritagewalksnetwork.com there's so much on the internet you can find these days and that explains uh, what Marcia's doing with her work um, and then uh, resources that are online I put this one back again because this was produced Three Continents One History was produced in Birmingham um, mm. in 2007 Birmingham the transatlantic slave trade and the Caribbean, um, Clive Harris was lead on that. So there's a, a great range of information that, uh, there. So we're trying to find resources that relate to, to places as well as themes. And this gives a bit more information about the, uh, the different chapters. Mm -hmm. Now, um, things that are coming up on Thursday, the 9th of December in conversation, um, this is with the, about the Birmingham Black oral history project 30 years on and this is being put on by Birmingham Museums and Art Gallery so the information's there for you if that might interest you. <laughs> if you had a graph of the number of things that have gone on about black history 
it just goes out of the roof when it gets to October and then all of a sudden it calms down again. <laughs> so, um, the Historical Association are calling for papers for a workshop at Bangor University next May. So Ankara, this is the one where I'm wondering if we, we can put something together about um, uh, the woolen industry specifically uh, generated to support the um, the slave trade so uh, uh, we've got time to do that it's interesting now this was interesting that I've made a little PowerPoint about this um, Audrey uh, who's with us today so delighted Audrey uh, and I discovered we had a shared interest in in Black History in Wales um, that's where I, I work from if you like um, and, um, and Audrey's uh, put together the most excellent article looking at the black people who lived in Wales way back and also some links with, uh, with families. So uh, absolutely excellent. Now, Audrey, your, your website is historicalroots.com. So it's history cal, historical roots putting the story into history.com. And the article is called Discovering Black History in Wales. Absolutely fabulous. And uh, I love the fact that you've got a really good photograph of, of the um, plaque that mentions Tabora the Black, the plaque that mentions Tabora the Black in Bumaris. So uh, that's something that I'm, I'm really interested in. But you, your knowledge and understanding and an exploration about uh, um, the different characters, just absolutely fantastic. I've actually picked this one out, Audrey. I hope you don't mind because I'm so fascinated by it. A very interesting map of Liverpool Bay because we haven't quite worked out the relationship Nick between North Wales and Liverpool, except we know it was part of the, the hinterland of, uh, of provisions, but a map like this makes it, um, shows how, you know, Lancaster, Liverpool, and then Flint, Chester, Conway, um, as well as Whitehaven and Dumfries, mm -hmm. you know, it was such a, an important area for, um, for us to look at further. Thanks for that one then. Then up to Scotland in the Liverpool, in the Edinburgh news, we've got, um, it was a headline, public asked <laughs> should the capital apologise for the historical links to slavery. This is um, the work that Professor um, Sir Jeff Palmer's doing. And um, so there's an interesting news article about that if you wanted to pick up on that. Over here in Australia, oh, it's been mm. great excitement because Ooh. The ABC, which is the equivalent of the BBC, had a history list, have a history listen series. And this is the most interesting and well produced um, podcast in that it's got sounds and interviews and all sorts of things on it, talking about the Caribbean convicts um, who came out mm -hmm. with the first fleet and subsequently and their stories. So that's fascinating as we face a lot of challenges here with racism within the European and other communities, never mind about the issues um, with the First Nations people. So that's really an interesting uh, thing. So uh, the, there was a, a live launch of this today. So I was able to listen at a reasonable time of day. It's really good. <laughs> I've also discovered this. Um, it's a bit sad here, really, but we've been in lockdown for so long, I've got used to it. Um, but I <laughs> discovered that the Derwent Valley Mills World Heritage Site sounds absolutely fantastic. No, somewhere that I've not been before. And this is about commodities. This is about cotton now. Simon talked to us about cotton, um, one of our earlier sessions some time back. But there's obviously a lot of, of work gone on here. And it's interesting that a lot of the work was done with community researchers as well. So as those of us who set this up in the first place are community researchers, then um, that's an interesting one to follow up some more, I'm sure we will. And more online resources, a reminder that English heritage have slavery in the British country house online for anybody to read free, but there aren't any pictures, unfortunately, and I haven't found any. And this is just some details about that. This is another one that I've just found. 
as we're looking at wider mm. the empire and the implications of the wider empire. And it was interesting to hear in Nick's talk today when you were saying, you know, that the saltpeat was it that had to come from India. Um, and so you, 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 you really begin to get an idea of the world trading that was going on. This is available online and it's quite readable. So um, reminder as well about the History of Africa series. So I've made a PowerPoint, which again, I'll, we're trying to find ways that we can share information best. Now this series of 21 long episodes um, uh, of interviews with African historians is absolutely uh, amazing. It's just amazing, it covers so many aspects. Um, and uh, that's available online and that's easy to access. And Black History Books, things that have come up now. Um, I took advantage of an article on the top 10 books about the aftermath of the empire. Um, and the first one was Imperial Intimacies, uh, which was fascinating to, to read the story. And the, the, um, the, the, the woman was Welsh. And she met um, a Jamaican um, during the war. Um, and Hazel tells her story, really very poignant, mm -hmm. a difficult story, but very interesting. And, and many, many similarities with, with other stories, sadly. Right, and then the, the number 10 one was The Life and Times of Michael Kay. That's a really interesting one because one of the things that we've not looked at is the history of South Africa. So that's that was that one. Picked out this one as well, the Yellow Wife. That looked um, a fascinating one um, with her her story. And then um, two more, half a yellow sun, um, and that's. Uh, uh, a capricious sweep of history and intimate relationships also works as a speed read on some of the biggest debates on post-imperial Africa. So when anybody's read any of these, please let me know. We also run a Black History Book Club on Wednesdays, so I'm going to add these in there. And I hope one day we're going to invite Satnam Sanghera, comes from Wolverhampton, where I come from. Um, and um, he's written Empire Land, which has got great mm. reviews. Um, and this one, the personal librarian, also is the story of um, uh, black history in the US. And I've said more than once before, black history in the US is different to black history in Britain and it's different to black history in Canada. And so we need to recognize the different histories. This was an interesting one though, again on empire. I missed seeing this one, um, but it was, um, an event put on by the Scottish BAME Writers Network and called Lost in the Archives, the Ayers in Scotland. And it's such an interesting, I've done a little bit of research around it, but you no, know, David, if you've come across this, I think you've mentioned it perhaps in, in the past. Um, yes, I, yes I've, I've been in touch with, with, with Jess Daly and yes, it is, it is fascinating. I think there's a lot to be explored in, in the history of both enslaved Indians in Britain and Indian servants in, in Britain. So what I'm trying to do with the things that we've missed seeing is to find the link so I can, can direct people to see them. Just to say that we're getting on well with season four. We've had all sorts of interesting sessions um, going on through, through this and now uh, we're following up with some of the things that we need to, um, for example, with Ayodeji um, last week, we're trying to get this photograph that he wants of the Reverend William Hughes so that he can, um, he can do that. I'm hoping next week, as well as um, Dr. Michael O'Connor from Mayo, um, we'll also have um, perhaps Rachel Lang join us again. She's from the Centre for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery. Um, and then the final session before Christmas, exploring reparation, we've got Alex Renton, the author of Blood Legacy. Um, and I'm in discussion with him uh, about, and, and others about legacies. And I had the opportunity, I don't know if you know, um, Robin Wedderburn, David, um, I had a long call, call with him today. Um, 
So we've got others, including His Excellency Seth George Ramakan, the Jamaican High Commissioner, and Vereen Shepherd, we will um, join us. She's in um, uh, Switzerland at the moment at the UNESCO event. Um, this is the, the book, Caribbean Slave Owners, another interesting story, all the less known histories from County Mayo um, that Michael's going to be telling us about and he's preparing his presentation. He was telling me in an email just now. And this is the uh, uh, Blood Legacy, Alex Renton's book. Uh, very interesting read. Alex Renton is um, a serious investigative reporter for The Times and he looked at his own Scottish family's links to slavery and found a whole lot. Uh, but as Sir Jeff Palmer says, you can't change history, but you can change its consequences. That'd be interesting. Okay, I think that's it then. Thank you for being patient so I'll let go through all those bits and pieces. Okay, well, thanks ever so much, everybody. Then. Uh, and a special thanks, Nicholas, to you. Um, so we'll Great to meet you all. We'll chat some more afterwards. Yeah, right. please get in touch. We'll See you, everyone. It's really nice to meet you. I hope to come to your future meetings. Oh. Can I come I in just with one thing there that you said? You said, can, you said about that website was my website. It isn't. It's not oh. my website. I must point that out. It's right. too. It's three fantastic retired people who run that historical roots website. Yeah, the, um, two of them are white British ex, um, ex civil servants, and one of them is the wife of one of them, and she's from Guyana and an ex teacher. And I just want to say something about historical roots. The reason I put my articles on there is because I, I love the website. Most of the stuff that goes on there is new research, not rehash the same old thing again. So while you're looking, if anybody looks at the article, please look at the whole website. And if you can, if you want to um, uh, subscribe, subscribe. It's, there's only like maybe two articles go on a month. It's not a big thing, but the, the what goes on there is really different. And, you know, you might find it interesting. Mm -hmm. Sorry for butting in, but I just, it is not my <laughs> Website. Yeah, that's perfectly all right. I do get things wrong sometime. And uh, thank you very much for that, Audrey. It's a great website, which is why I wanted to big it up. <laughs> okay, great. So if we finish the recording now and then we can catch up with any other points. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Are you around? Well, we'll carry on with the recording then, shall we? <laughs> Simon will switch it off when it needs to be run over a bit. Uh, so thank you ever so much then Nicholas, that's great and uh, maybe we you could join us again Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, I'll keep spring. it on your calendar and I'll try and, drop, I'll try and, I'll try and attend. It'd be great. I look forward to speaking to you, uh, some of you in, uh, you know, drop me an email or, or we can meet privately. Good. Whatever. It's fine. Good. And, and, and uh, thank your daughter you. very much indeed, will you? Because I know she wanted your time this morning. <laughs> <laughs> She's napping now, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> My wife put All it out. Right, and please do get in touch. It is absolutely fantastic. Will yes. do, Marcia. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Oh, I've got you. I've got you. I'll make sure I copy down your details mm -hmm. here. Great. Yeah. All right. Yeah. See you, everyone. Bye. <laughs> okay, then. So I've just checked the chat and I can now stop the recording if I knew how to stop the recording. <laughs> Record. Stop recording. Oh, what fun. On a nope. All right, well, I can't stop the recording, so I don't want to hear any personal secrets, all right? We'll <laughs> 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 just wrap it up then. Are you okay, Marcia? Um, yes, I'm fine, thank uh, you. Yes, wonderful. Natalie yeah. was anxious that you'd not uh, been able to catch up with her. Well, and that, no, no. I a text her Easter oh gosh on Tuesday I dropped my phone the screen shattered and it was on Tuesday I meant to get in touch with and say can we meet up tomorrow so I've apologized profusely I've explained and we will have a meeting next week oh it's one of those things it's good because we're able to network between yes, Jim I will uh, put the websites mentioned by you and the others in the notes of the meeting I'll do that that's fine and Anne-Marie, we look forward to hearing more about what you're doing. OK, oh, well, I, look, I look forward to, uh, to letting you know. But my, uh, my, just one question, the notes of the meeting, where, where would I access those? Well, 
but it's just the PowerPoint and I'm not very good at this, but I promise this week I will put it, I will put it on the website. So it's blackhistoryconversations.com. Right, okay, I'll make a note of Try and make the links active. I've learned how to do that, so that's an improvement. Okay. Good. Lovely. So, and if you, Anne-Marie, if you've got anything you hear of, because Audrey uh, is really good, if you, she sees anything in the UK press or anything, any link she comes across, you, you send them to me, Audrey, and I really appreciate it because, you know, I would miss things otherwise, you know, not seeing them. Right. Okay, but well, I will bear I will bear that in mind. Yes, yes, definitely. Okay, well, we really look forward to you joining us, and the recordings are all on that website, so you can always okay. go back over things again. If you Fantastic, can. lovely. The presentations have been really, really great. Thanks ever so much, Anne Marie. It's lovely. No, thank you. And Anne Marie, um, what, what can you put your email in the chat? Because we, yes, we do. Simon would be able to do it, but then I can I can respond a little bit more quickly. No so problem. Alison, lovely, uh -huh. Alison. It's lovely to see you then, and I'm glad we had a chat beforehand. And uh, as Audrey let you know about the sessions, then Alison, Alison, do you do you speak? Oh, thing? sorry. Yes, yeah, so, um, Audrey sent me the the. Um, the link so I, I was able to join both both times yes because oh, i'm a friend good. of audrey we're in the same group yeah oh well, that's great yes so it's really good and we've got different numbers of people who who come in and uh, mm. and join in some people mm. regularly watch it offline but uh, mm. that's great no it's really interesting really interesting anyway i'm going to go now i'm going to go now <laughs> we need to wrap up now so i hope anybody who's thank you very much it's lovely seeing everybody thank you bye everybody and bye -bye. Uh, I won't stay on and chat yeah. with you because yeah. I can't switch the recording on. Okay. <laughs> it's fine because I've got to nip off somewhere anyway for in the next five minutes. So we'll catch up anyway. Yeah. Right. Jolly good then. Well, you switch yourselves off and I'll make sure that I get everything off the chat. Okay. okay. So I'm saying goodbye now. I'm saying take care. Yeah. And um, see you soon. Okay. Bye bye. All right, lovely then, Audrey. Thanks ever so much. I really mean that. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. it was very good that this program today, and I'm definitely going to be in touch with Nick. <laughs> oh yes, he's uh, uh, got so much um, that he can share with us. Absolutely marvelous. So, where are the other bits and pieces? Oh, I'll leave now, if, if, and, but we, we'll have a talk one day, but I'm just up to here with things at the minute, so next week. I love the, 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 I love the um, article, and um, I'm really sorry that I got it wrong about the website. Oh, no, 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 that, I just wanted to big them up, that's all, because they do a fantastic job. And also to get a few more subscribers for them because they, you know, the uh, people do go and watch things. But the, the, you know, I'd like to see that the, 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 they were appreciated, that they knew they were appreciated. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much. That's marvelous. Thanks, Emma. Bye. Bye.